amazing Calvary Chapel. Lord bless you guys as we just come to worship him and to pray and just to receive his word from him in all beauty, wisdom, and uh, all knowledge that he has for us. Uh, Lord, just open up our hearts and our minds as we come to you, Lord, tonight, Father, just to receive from you, Lord, to give back to you. Lord, just to worship you, to serve you, to honor you and to praise you. Lord, let our hearts and minds be in the right place. As Father, we just bow down and we submit ourselves to you. We ask you, Lord, just to fill us with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, just give us all understanding as only you can. Mold us, shape us, Lord, into who you want us to be. And Lord, as we gather together in your name tonight, let your name be honored and let it be high and lifted up. And Lord, we pray for those that are sick, that Father, are suffering somehow, uh, be it spiritual, physical, or emotional, Lord. We just pray, Father, for your touch upon them. And Lord, just thank you for who you brought tonight. It's always a blessing, Lord. We love you. We thank you. And we just lift these things before you now in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, you won't turn back, I know you are near. I will fear no evil, for my God is with me, and if my God is with me, whom then shall I fear, whom then shall I fear, oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh, no, you never let go. Lord, you never let go of me. And I can see the light that is coming for the heart that holds on. A glorious light beyond all compare. And there will be an end to these troubles but until that time comes we'll live to know you're here on the earth i will fear no evil for my god is with me if my god is with me whom then shall i fear whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go In every high and every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me Yes, I can see the light that is coming for the heart that holds on There will be an end To these troubles But until that day comes Still I will praise you Still I will praise you Lord Oh no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low Oh no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me I'll hide the chasm 
that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. And Jesus, yours is the Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, the living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living
great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we Search 
searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am perfect in all of your ways you are perfect in all of your ways to us you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am who I am, it's who I am. Love so undeniable, I, I can hardly speak. Peace so unexplainable, I, I can hardly think. As you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I I won't be overwhelmed 
give me vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord, my shield. I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, Lord. Jesus, I have 
decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. My Jesus. Jesus, we love you so much. We thank you, Jesus, for wearing that, that crown of thorns on your head. We thank you, Jesus, for every stripe that you took on your back in our place. We thank you, Jesus, for taking our unrighteousness and giving us your righteousness. We thank you, Jesus, for the love that poured out through every drop of blood we thank you, Jesus, for being here right now. We thank you for our family. We thank you for heaven that waits for us. We thank you for going to prepare that place for us, God. We thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to you except through Jesus. We thank you, Lord God, for all that you've done for us. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. We honor you. We glorify your wonderful, magnificent name. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Love one another.
Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. Hate to break up all the, all the fellowship. Well, I do, I do. I'd let you guys talk forever, I don't care. <laughs> Anyway, it's another beautiful day. Not too hot, not too cold. Just right. Okay, tonight our pastor is going to expound on Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 26. Okay, here we go. Yeah, I know. You guys are watching that now. See, now you guys know. (laughs) Now I got to watch every single word. (laughs) Okay. Anyway. Well, I'll do it. I'll do it out of another version. How's that? (laughs) Okay, anyway. Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 to 26. Now all the people witnessed the thundering, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, You speak with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me, gods of silver or gods of gold. You shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice it, your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it out of hewn stone, for if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Nor shall you go up by steps to my altar, that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Okay, I didn't get the last one. I'm sure he'll explain that. Um, It always says children of God. Okay, the children of God did this. The children of God was a witness. The children of God did this. Where were the adults? No, I'm just joking. (laughs) Anyway, let's let's pray. (laughs) Har, har. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for another day that we come to worship you and praise you and love on you. And we do praise you that we could come together and uh, without fear of being hauled off to jail or a concentration camp or something. We do give you all the praise, all the glory. Please anoint our pastor tonight as he teaches us from your word. And we do give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. supposed to be a study on the fear of God tonight. I think it'd be better titled The Fear of Bob. With concentration camps and uh, it's like what's up with that? Good evening. Let's open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. For the last couple of months, we have kind of been going through this text and talking about the Ten Commandments. Not quite zooming through it, I wouldn't say. It's taken us a while. But we looked in depth at each one of the commandments and we talked about how they affect us today and what their impact is. We need to now zoom back out and remember what got us here. The book of Exodus started in Egypt with the Israelites enslaved unto the Egyptians. And we saw how that God brought deliverance. 
to Israel as God showed his superiority over the various Egyptian gods, little g. And he used, if you remember, the plagues, things like turning the Nile into blood and frogs and bugs and disease, and then finally the death of the firstborn of every Egyptian family. And when the people left Egypt, we saw how God led them sort of into a trap, a canyon that ended at the Red Sea with the Egyptian army behind them. The Israelites had nowhere else to go but to call upon the name of the Lord. And you all know that God parted the Red Sea for them. And the people crossed on dry land. The Egyptian army drowned as it tried to follow them. And the people were saved. As the people made their way out of Mount Sinai, or towards Mount Sinai, we talked about how God provided water in the desert with Moses striking the rock. God made water gush out of the split rock. And just amazing the way in which he provided. And after God led them around to the backside of the mountain, which is known as Sinai, or thorny in the Hebrew, or Mount Horeb, which means desert in the Hebrew. God himself, after leading them over there, shows up. And in Exodus chapter 19, if you want to flip back into the previous chapter, and in verse 16 it says, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. It was at this point that God spoke the words that we call the Ten Commandments. He goes on now in verse 18 of chapter 20. We pick up where we left off. And we find that Moses is speaking regarding the people being afraid of God's presence. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. It's taken us three months to get through these events, but it only was a matter of moments for the Israelites to have their encounter with God. These thunderings in the Hebrew refer to or mean voice or sound or noise. This might be describing thunder, but it also might refer to the fact that the people had actually heard God speak. Could you imagine hearing the voice of God? I kept reading this over and over again. Along with the noise and the light show, the thunderings and the lightnings, the people have actually heard the voice of God. Then they said to Moses, verse 19, you speak with us, you speak with us, and we'll hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. Two things of note here. So powerfully, Did God's power and potency, his glory and his grandeur, so powerful did it convict the people that they said, Moses, we want you to speak to us. Because if God speaks to us, surely we're going to die. And really that's the way it's supposed to be. The word of God we know is powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword, it pierces, it divides, it kills our pride, it kills our self-centeredness, our flesh. 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And because it does those things, the person who wants to pamper his flesh, the person caught up in sins of the flesh, will often be one who doesn't want to hear the voice of God anymore. Doesn't want to hear from God anymore. If I choose to indulge in my flesh day after day, week after week, I won't be at Bible study six months down the road. That's the impact and the effect that it has. And so guys, it's the Word of God so very important and essential within our walk, within our life, because it brings life to us. It cuts asunder. It's able to go to the very heart of the issues of our life. If we are having problems with self-centeredness, if our flesh is rebelling within us, it has a way of dealing with the flesh, of cutting it out. It has a way of dealing with the things that we struggle with, whether it be our pride or whether it be our self-centeredness. If you're at a place in your life where lately it's been hard to get into the Word of God, I've got great news for you. Because God wants to do something special in you. He really honestly does, guys. Satan sees what God desires to do and is trying to keep you from that blessing. But God wants you to have it. It's a big blessing. It's a great blessing. But in order to get it and to receive it, you've got to pick up the Word of God. Let God speak to you, and I'll guarantee you, you will feel exhilarated in your spirit. You will feel not only blessed, but you'll feel filled up to overflowing. Number two thing I want you to note here, aside from the Word, is the people, notice, were too afraid to get close or too close to God. They wanted someone to act as a go-between, a mediator between God and them. The people were absolutely, I mean, terrified at hearing God speak to them, as I think any of us would be. And I don't even know where to begin to guess what that voice would sound like, but I'm sure it would shake you to your very soul. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 23, we read, So it was when you heard the voice from the midst of darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, that you came near to me. All the heads of your tribes and of your elders. And you said, surely the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness. And we have heard his voice from the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God speaks with man. Yet he still lives. Now therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the midst of the fire as we have and lived? You go near and hear all that the Lord our God may say and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you. So Moses, you just mosey on along, Moses. And you go and you listen to God. And you hear what he's saying. Take good notes because we want to hear it. But we just don't want to hear it directly. We don't want to go near. Moses, you do it. Hear it and do it. And then the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have heard the voice of the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. And I love it. He says, they are right in all that they've spoken. They got it right. It's, it's a good thing for you to be a go-between, Moses. You come, I'll talk with you. You go back and you talk with them. But the Lord said, they're right in what they have spoken. He said that the response of the people was the right one. That they did need a mediator. They did need someone to stand between them and God. And, and really, truth be told, you and I, we need a mediator as well. Just like these people were in need of someone to go between them and God. 
And we have one. We have one whose name is Jesus. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Jesus is our go-between. Jesus is the one that goes to the Father for us and comes to us for the Father. He's the bridge to get us to God so that now we can go straight to God. Verse 20 says, Moses said to the people, do not fear. Why? Because they were fearful. But do not fear for God has come to test you and that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. Like the BMW engineer eager to take the car he's put together for a test drive to rev up the RPMs and fine tune it. In a similar way, God wants to fine tune us in order that we won't go careening off course, that we won't lose control. And so here, Moses speaking for the Lord, do not fear for God has come to test you. People of Israel, they wanted to separate themselves from the manifest presence of God. They didn't like being in that place, in that position. But what he's saying here is that God meant it for good in order to test them, to try them, to make them go beyond what they think that they could ever go beyond, to make them grow, to cause them to mature in the things of the Lord. And this test that he was to give revealed to them what kind of God they served. A God above nature. A personal God. A good God. And a holy God. But the testing was the revealing of that. To see what had transpired within their own heart. What had transpired in their own life. God desires to do that same testing and needs to do that same testing in our life. To see if we've progressed to see if we've moved forward. And so it reveals to them what kind of God they serve. Secondly, it revealed to them what the expectations of God was. What does God expect out of you? You know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. To walk in humility. To walk in the grace of God. But not only for the expectations was it there. The test revealed to them their own weakness. It revealed to them and showed them their own need for God's grace, for God's help, and for God's rescue. And again, the Word of God has the way of revealing that to you and to I. But by way of these tests that the Lord... You guys are you're old, you may not even be old enough to remember this, but I remember when I was a kid and we had that... that one-eyed snake in our house, that, that television. That every once in a while, there would be this pattern that would flow up, fly up on the screen, and there'd be this noise, something like that, I don't know what it is. And then all of a sudden, it would break in, it goes, this is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Remember, it is only a test. But it would ruin your best favorite show because at that time, they didn't have the technology to interrupt and pick up right where they left off. They just wiped out whatever was in their way. So we got really upset and really mad at them. But the test, to see if you were ready, to see if you've grown, to see if you've matured, to see if you're moving in the right direction. He says, do not fear, for God has come to test you in this. And so Moses said, don't fear. That his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. He wants to set us up to succeed. Before you is in your face, right in front of you. Before, the King James says that his fear may be before your eyes that you sin not. Fear, speaking of to stand in awe of or reverence or honor or respect. And what's interesting is that these people are told not to be afraid. 
And yet God wants his fear to be before them. You say, what's going on? Well, the idea is that there's a wrong fear and a right fear. The wrong fear. God doesn't want us to have that wrong fear. The phrases that are in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But the phrase, fear not, or do not fear. Do not fear, 51 times. Fear not, 11 times. Do not be afraid, 50 times. Easily found throughout the scriptures. Over a hundred times, God tells us not to be afraid of him. Not to fear God. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Just the amazing steadfastness of our Father and the encouragement that He gives when you're afraid. Don't be afraid. Write this down. Put it on an a, a index card. Put it someplace where you see it all the time. Fear not, I am with you. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But it's not just in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy. And then again in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. What that means, guys, is if we have the wrong fear working in us, it will drive us away from God. Which fear is right? Which fear is the right fear? Well, as a kid, when you saw a Frankenstein movie, you probably wanted to run away. When I look at my little grandson, Eli, and we're just sitting there watching one of his shows or whatever, and especially around Halloween, those dreadful commercials come up. And they've got ugly looking beasts and things like that on him. And you can just see him. He, he's just struck with fear. And he buries his head into the couch. Otherwise he runs into the bedroom as fast as he can. That's the wrong kind of fear. But then as an adult, as you're driving down the street and you see a police officer in your rear view mirror, you want to drive in the correct manner. And that's the right fear. So which one best describes what our fear of God should be? Well, I tell you this much. It's not the Frankenstein monster kind of fear. And so he puts this fear, this right fear, in order, verse 20 says, that you may not sin. Now last time we met and we taught, we made a point how love causes obedience. This week the lesson is, the right kind of fear causes obedience. Because the right fear drives you towards God and to God. The right fear helps you to obey God. Don't think that the concept of fearing God is just a failed Old Testament concept either. Because as I said, we're told many times in the New Testament that we need a healthy fear of God. In fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, in verse 4, 5, he says, And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And afterward, that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he was killed, or has killed, that's capital H-E. Fear him who has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. Jesus is telling us there to fear God because he's the one that has the ability to send a person to hell. Fear can be centered around what God could do to you while love of God and love for God is based on what God has done for you. When the church was born on the day of Pentecost, it was more than just speaking in tongues. It was more than that stuff that was going on. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 says, Then 
Fear came upon every soul. There was fear that was there. There was an uncertainty. There was a, as they looked at the goings on, as they looked at the speaking in tongues, as they looked at all the things that were taking place, it says that fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Many works being done. And Peter, regarding this, wrote in First Peter chapter 1, verse 17, he says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, and then he says, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Conduct yourself in fear. You know, you might have the tendency to go, why? That your sin would be for one thing before your face. That you would look at these things and they would alter your stay and your story. He goes on saying, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And you'll notice that as Peter's going along, he's connecting the fear of God with our conduct. He's bringing the two together. And you notice how also he reminds us of what Christ has done for us. He wants us to have our, our eyes focused on Jesus. Jude, in Jude 1, 22 through 23, our verses 21 through 23. He says, and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but with others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. You know, as you look at some folks, they have a tendency to respond to the love of God. And the love of God draws them. And they respond to those things. They respond to compassion that you would give to them. But there's still others that will respond with fear, the fear of fire, the fear of hell. The lesson that he gives here is that that love, fear, tension very much alive. But as healthy Christians, we need to keep a healthy tension in our lives between the love of God and the fear of God. Those both need to be present within our life. It's not an either or proposition. It's a both and and. You've got to have both of those things working. In our house, between the kitchen and the garage, we have a door and on that door, I don't have it on there anymore because I took it off. But there's a hydraulic kind of door closer on it. One of those little cylindrical things that makes the door shut automatically when you're done with it. And it seems like when I had that on there, that every once in a while, an adjustment needed to be made to make it work just, just right. If it was set too high, then the door would slam every time someone comes in the door. If you have it set too low, then the door doesn't close all the way. It's tension in balance that makes it work right. Having that balance on both sides. We need that balance in our walk, in our life as believers. It is the balance of love and of fear. A lot of times people don't talk about fear, but you're looking here at the Israeli uh, children of Israel and they're just like freaking out at the Lord and just how ominous and how fearful they are hearing even just his voice. If we operate too much out of fear, you're going to find yourself looking over your shoulder, worried that some little thing might displease God, almost becoming obsessive, compulsive, about your relationship with God and operating out of the legalism rather than operating out of the grace of God. One of my favorite detective shows is the TV show Monk. It's a guy that has serious emotional problems. He's obsessive, compulsive. He's always afraid of everything. Kind of reminds myself, myself of myself at times, not very often. 
But too much of that fear in our life is like the garage door that slams every time someone opens it up. If we operate out of too much of, out of love, then we run the risk of forgetting that God is more than just our big buddy. He's God Almighty. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And see, we can run the risk of letting some things slide in our life because after all, you know, God's our big buddy. And so not enough fear to balance the love. And it's like a garage door that never quite closes. Verse 21 picks up. It says, so the people, they stood afar off. But Moses drew near the thickness or the thick darkness where God was. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. But Moses knew God had called them to that. And so beginning in chapter 22, verse 22, and going clear on through to chapter 23, we start a section of scripture that runs through that text. And Moses describes this section as the book of covenant, according to chapter 24, verse 7. Then he took the book of covenant and read in the hearings of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. This book of covenant is going to give more details on what the Ten Commandments are all about. Now, within this book of covenant is the law of the altar. And it says in verse 22, Then the Lord said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver, gods of gold, you shall not make for yourself. And so we're going back and finding more detail on the first couple of commandments. And they were given to us in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 20. It says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Now, at this point, God turns to put it into perspective. For he, if you remember, we've been talking about, has just spoken to them from heaven. And they heard his voice, and it scared the bejeebers out of them. Fashioning little gods was really not an option. Little gods with a little g. Whether it be out of silver, whether it be out of gold. You see, what that is, is it's man's way of deciding what his G-O-D little g is going to be like. It's going to be made in the image of what he has in his mind. But you see there's a problem with that. Because they've heard the voice of God. Same thing happens with us. If we hear the voice of God. God can make that change in us. God will point out to us. The things that are not pleasing unto him. The things that hinder us in our walk. The things that distract pull away and put us in a serious condition. But talking about these fashioning of gods, what they're going to be like, they're God. But there's a problem now because they've heard God's voice. There's no longer, and and this is what it does to a person, when you hear the voice of God, you cannot rest. You're not comfortable with anything else. Because you know, you've heard the voice of God. There's no longer any place, any room for speculation. There's no longer any room for guesswork. There's no longer that man, well, I, you know, I, I, I'm not really sure. Yeah, you are sure. Because he's told us and he's told you. And so the point here being, we should no longer be making up our own silly ideas of what God is like. And that's what we do. When we make that carved image, when we put that image, whatever it's made out of, however it's made. 
You know, that carved image could be a new car. It could be a, a new bike. It could be any number of things. And we begin to worship it. And we begin to put it on display in our life. But we should move away from that. Why? Because we've heard God's voice. And there's that tension that is within us. We shouldn't be making up little ideas and stories. We just simply need to pay attention to what God has told us about himself. Verse 24, an altar of earth you shall make for me. And you shall sacrifice it on your burnt offerings, or on it, your birth offerings. And your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. The, the saying goes, after the law is heated, an altar is always needed. After the law is heated, an altar is always needed. And when we really hear the law of God, man, we realize that we're sinners in need of a sacrifice. In need of a sacrifice to take away our lawlessness, our iniquity, our failure, and our sin. But what do we know about this altar? Well, first of all, he tells us that it's an altar of earth. Adama is the word that's used in the Hebrew. It says ground, land. The name of the first man made from the earth, Adam, ties in nicely with this. And I find it interesting that when the pagan Gentile, Naomen, was healed from his leprosy by Elisha, he asked to take two mule, woes, two mule loads of the earth, Adama, to build an altar to Yahweh back in Syria. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 17. You see, he thought it was the dirt. He thought the dirt was the thing that made the difference in being healed. And so he wanted to take a couple of huge mule-towing wagons full of this dirt so that he could have it back where he is in Syria, thinking that the dirt is the difference. It's also interesting that in the New Testament, Jesus is known as the second Adam. And so we see the first Adam and we see also the second Adam. The first Adam's act of sin resulted in all of us living under condemnation and death. The second Adam's act of sacrifice resulted in salvation being possible for every man. The record where we record our name to cause to remember, to remind. It, it's where that phrase, in remembrance of me, that there's a record of what Jesus Christ did. There's a record of the death that he died. And then he says, come and bless. God will respond to the sacrifices of the people if they're done in the proper way and if they're done at the proper place. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 24, he says, build altars in the place where I remind you who I am and I will come and I will bless you there. The Bible tells us that each of us are a temple of the living God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, or do you not know that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. And he's dealing here at this point with worship. My worship will bring blessing. Our worship to God, as we turn our hearts towards him, as we turn our adoration towards him, he says in his promise to us, is he says, I will bless you in that place. And so guys, our worship brings blessing. It brings blessing to me, it brings blessing to our God. And so God talks about the burnt offerings. He talks about the peace offerings. The burnt offering being the offering when the entire animal is burnt on the altar. The animal represented you. 
It was a picture of consecration, of giving yourself completely to God. It's as if your entire life was being consumed on the altar and your entire being is being given to God, consumed completely. A peace offering was a celebration of being right with God, right way, wrong way. It was having a meal with God. It was sitting down and supping with Him. It was like, a little bit like communion. We live in a fast-paced culture. But some things ought not to happen so fast. In fact, some things just ought to happen slowly. In the book, Final Salute, it tells the story of Major Steve Beck. He's a U.S. Marine whose heart-wrenching task was informing the nearest of kin when a Marine was killed in Iraq. But Beck doesn't just break the sad news and then leave. For several days, he may help the family through the process of the funeral, which includes supervising the Marine honor guard that stands near the fallen soldier's body. The honor guard learns from Beck how to salute their follow, fellow fallen Marine soldiers as they leave or resume guard with a very, what they call, slow salute. It's not taught in basic training. The slow salute requires a three-second rising of the hand to the head, a three-second hold, and then a three-second lowering of the hand. A gesture of respect that takes about nine times longer than normal. Beck explains, he says, the salute to your fallen comrades should take time. Indeed, those who die serving their country are worthy of great honor, worthy of a slow salute, worthy of the extra time. To do some things fast, just to get them done so that we can move on to the next thing in our lives, it sends a subtle message of disrespect. And so it's the same with our worship to God. God deserves a slow salute. He deserves the time that we give to him, not rushed. Our Savior, who gave his life for us, is worthy of our time. Paul wrote to the Romans, chapter 12 and verses 1 through 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable for, to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is truly the alternate lifestyle. The difference that an altar makes in a person's life. This is the blessed lifestyle. Because God earlier, remember, promised to bless the person who offers worship from the altar of dirt. Putting each one of these pieces together, the altar of dirt. Some churches today in our culture, they specialize in generating emotion. The platform people are experts at moving worshipers to tears or to laughter. Attenders gradually learn to elevate the service in terms of the emotions that they feel. In time, however, the law of diminishing returns sets in. It can't last forever. It doesn't go on forever. Prayers are offered in a highly emotive style and bathed in background music. Stories have to get more dramatic. Songs need to get more sentimental preaching more histrionic in order to keep people having the intense emotional experiences. That kind of worship oftentimes is shallow, sometimes artificial. Rarely is it reflective. A little attention, little attention is given to worshiping with the mind. And it produces people who have little depth or rootedness 
they may develop a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, according to Romans chapter 10 and verse 2. And oftentimes what they become is worship junkies, searching for whichever church can best supply the better rush. That's what is referred oftentimes to as scarecrow worship. It would be better if only it had a brain. And I don't say that facetiously, but we're missing much. And much is lost. On the other hand, though, there are some churches that focus keenly on cognitive correctness. They recite huge creeds distribute reams of exegetical information, craft careful, exacting prayers ahead of time, and yet the heart and the spirit are not seized with the wonder and the passion that characterize those in Scripture who must fall on their faces when they encounter the living God. No one is ever so moved that they actually moved And that's tragic because Dallas Willard writes to handle the things of God without worship is always to falsify them. Those who attend such services may be competent to spot theological error, but the unspoken truth is they're also a little bored. Their worship is dry. It does not connect with their deepest hurts or their deepest desires. And rarely does it generate awe or healing and not much act of joy. Where have we come? Where have we come from? I remember times when I was in a charismatic church and growing up in Santa Barbara in high school. And I remember just the generated or almost seemingly manufactured, and I don't want to say that in a judging way. So I'm trying to pick my words carefully. But my heart desires a genuine worship, a genuine relationship with our Heavenly Father. The authentic is so, so important especially when it comes to the battle that we're engaged in. We need to search our hearts and see if what we're doing, what we're participating in is what the Lord would have for us and want for us. And does it bring the depth? And if not, let's get on our knees and just say, Lord, fill us again. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Let us not get into just going through the motions. But let revival start. And let it start in me. That worship that is more cognitive. A little dry, if you would. is like the tin man worship. If it only had a heart but really our brain and heart should both be engaged. But the love that we have for the Father, we need to find the balance in that tension, balance in the door that it doesn't slam shut and it doesn't stay open. But there's a beautiful blend and balance in those things. We need the blessing of the heart and the mind which comes from finding the balance. We need to worship with all of us, all on the altar. Present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. Verse 25, And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it out of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. The altar was not to be an ornate or artistic kind of a product, but rather it was supposed to be simple. So simple, just like 
our Father is in so many things. He doesn't make things so complicated for us that we have to have a doctorate to figure them out. He doesn't make things so difficult that we, we look at them and we just go, what? No, made of dirt or uncarved or uncut stone. Why? Why would he go to the trouble to instruct that it be in this way? The reason, guys, is so that the focus would not be on the altar, but on the sacrifice. And the sacrifice speaks of who? Jesus Christ. Where's the focus of all that we do for Christ? What do we focus on? Do we focus on us because we had some accomplishment or something that we can look at and point to and say, look at me? Or is it because God tested us? It's just a test. It's just a test. Don't run from it. He's using the fear to bring about before us that test. And he wants to accomplish in you and I. He wants to do a work that as we look at it, we just go, I mean, it's like it's like that clay pot and the potter the digging and, and, and the molding and the shaping and the, client, the kiln and the heating up and you know all these things that go into creating that pot, that vessel. And then looking at it, and it's like the beauty is not in the vessel itself, but the beauty being in what lies within. Jesus Christ our Savior, our Lord. For behold, we have these treasures in earthen vessels. That's what God is doing, what he desires to do. Take the focus off of you and put the focus on that sacrifice on the altar as we give ourselves daily the Lamb of God. And generally speaking, the Father that a people stray away from a real relationship with God, the greater the tendency will be towards grandeur and glory and altar building. God doesn't want us to be altar builders. He's not into Bill's altar building business and construction. But the work that he's doing, that sacrifice, that work, in us as we are sanctified as we're set apart that the grandeur and the glory would go to him that the spirit of God would move artisans and architects they, they try to figure out how to create a feeling to mask the lack but the heart of the father is that the focus always be on the Son in your life as well. The heart of our Father is that the focus would be on the Son. Verse 26, Nor shall you go up by steps to the altar that your nakedness may not be exposed on it. Not only was there to be this simplicity in worship, that's what he's speaking of here. That there would be a simplicity in worship, but there was also to be a humility as well. Clothed in robes, the higher priest, the higher the priest climbed on the altar, the more exposed they would be to the people below. To rectify this, the Lord ordered the priest to stay grounded. The publican cried, God be merciful to me, a sinner, with his eyes downcast in Luke 18, 13. The worship that God honors is not a set of 12 steps by where one climbs higher and higher. It is one step, the simple step to the Savior. 
Therefore, from the very beginning, as God gives the law to his people, he says, guys, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Focus on the sacrifice, not on the structure, and stay humble. Keep it simple. Focus on the sacrifice, not on the structure, and stay humble. Now, some consider this to be have like a temporary law. At this point, the garments for the priest haven't been made yet. Bob was saying, what, are they, what the heck is that all about? Garments, the official garments hadn't been made. So who knows what a priest might be wearing under his tunic. Later, the garments of the priest would be very specific, right down to the underwear. In Ezekiel's temple, there will be steps going up to the altar. Ezekiel 43, verse 16 and 17. But the priest will be dressed appropriately. Ezekiel 44, verse 18. In linen trousers, it says. But prior to that, there was no rules or regulation. And God says, you know what? what where does the attention go? The attention goes on God, not on me. The attention goes on God, not on you. It's not about you. It really truly is not about us. But to God be the glory. To God be the honor and God be the praise. That's where it needs to go. I think that some of us like attention maybe just a little too much. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that trap of worshiping in a way that makes sure that everyone sees, hey, I'm worshiping God. Look at me. Let's not have people look at us. J. Vernon McGee wrote this. He says, I've had very few real compliments since I've been a minister. But there's one I remember well. When I was a pastor as a student in Georgia, I used to preach in a church on the side of a red clay hill. One morning after the message and everyone had left it, except for one country boy. He wore high yellow shoes that buttoned all the way. And he was just kind of waiting around, as timid as could be. Finally, he came up to me with tears in his eyes and he took a hold of my hand. And he said, I did not know Jesus was so wonderful. He wanted to say something else, but was too choked up with emotion. So he turned and he walked out of the little church. That church today is in the middle of a city. But in those days, it was in the middle of a cotton patch. He said, I watched that country boy walk across the cotton patch. And I said to myself, oh God, let me so preach the people will know that Jesus is wonderful. That was a compliment, and I have not had many like it. Father, we just come to you, Lord. You've given us much, and I pray that, Lord, you would just tie it all together. From, Father, just the things concerning fear and being fearful, the tension that exists between love and fear, that is healthy, that is good. And Father, the whole concept of this altar that, Lord, you have provided. But more than the altar, that which is on the altar, the sacrifice, the sacrifice that you gave to us through your Son, Jesus Christ, by which, Lord, you paved the way for us to have fellowship Point in Neo, Lord, with you. Lord, I just pray, Father, that you would put this all together and that, Lord, you would give to us a more thorough understanding of just your truths, your ways, the desire that you have, Lord, that as we present ourselves a living sacrifice, that, Lord, you might take us and use us for your glory. And yet, not that any attention would be focused on us. That we might just be able to reveal your great love 
your great mercy and just the great work that, Lord, you want to do in people's lives. Help us, Lord, to be your instrument. Help us to be, Lord, your surrendered vessel that you might use it in whatever way that you would desire. We're thankful, Lord. Thank you for this time. Dig deep within us. And let us, Lord, just be completely surrendered to you in your way. We love you so much. And we just, we thank you, Lord, for this word of encouragement. And we just give you the glory, the honor, and the praise now. In Jesus' most precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen, guys. God bless you. Love on one another. Encourage one another. And may the Lord go with you.